according to my limited experience. The majority of those who try to read the Bible from cover to cover usually meet their Waterloo with the book of Leviticus. Now, you have to understand, the first two books of the First Testament are real page-turner. Uh, in Genesis, we have the stories of the creation, the flood with Noah, follow with uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Exodus, the second book, revolve around Moses' call and journey to free his people from slavery. And this book ends with Moses coming back from 40 days on Mount Sinai, only to discover that this people has made a golden calf. So Moses, in anger, smashed the tablet he received from God. And I'm not making that up. You can check Exodus 32, verse 19. He smashed the tablets. I have to go back on the mountain to get a new one and return to lead the construction of the tabernacle for the Ark of the Covenant. And as we're ready to get in the groove of this action-packed narrative, we are offered 27 chapters of random series of laws and obscure background of religious ritual. I'm not saying these words are worthless, no, no. It's just that this part of the Bible is confusing for most of us because it give us a window on a world that is far from us, that is different from us, that seems to be totally foreign. For many different reasons, the book of Leviticus is viewed as something negative that is better to be ignored in our churches. Since it deals with Jewish rituals, regulations, and priestly directive, well, many good Christians argue that at the Council of Jerusalem, which is recorded in Act 15, the obligation to follow the law of Moses was lifted. So our Christian faith should not be defined by arcane details of animal sacrifice and skin disease or restriction about the amount of material that can be woven in one single cloth or, or the presence or not of tattoos on her body. And interestingly, sometimes the same Christians will drag a verse or two from Leviticus and bring it into the 21st century and claim that it applies directly to us and our time. Of course, you might know the famous chapter 20, verse 13, which says, if a man lies with a man as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination, they shall be put to death. They will say these are the words of God that ought to be obeyed because it's in Leviticus, saying this between two bites of bacon. This sort of hand-picked use of carefully edited, edited passages of the Bible have led many to see Christians as just a bunch of hypocrites that follow God only when it's convenient, only when it fits their own agenda. But let's stick to the text. Let's try. Which, the one today, come from chapter 19. Which, this text is part of a larger section, scholar called the Old Holiness Code. The people of Israel are called to maintain holiness in the community with off-repeat refrain, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord God, am holy. And as we hear this statement, as we read this statement, we might be afraid that we are in for a very long and leg 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 legalistic session of everything fun that we shall not do, and how we should cross every T and put a dot on every I. However, as we read this text, we discover it's not that bad. It's not as rigid and narrow-minded as expected. In fact, many fundamental elements of the Ten Commandments are found here. Do not steal, 
do not bear false witnesses, do not lie to one another, uh, do not take revenge against your neighbor, do not reveal the, the death or put a stumbling block just in front of a blind person. And we might be tempted to say, this, this is not holiness. This is just plain old common sense. What's, what's, the, what's the link between the two? Well, too often, we make the mistake to equate holiness with perfection or some sort of moral superiority. We believe holiness is about making grand sacrifice in the name of our God or speaking pious prayer filled with approved theological formula. We believe it's reserved only for some hermits living in caves or, or some special inspired people, but not for us, you and me, common people. However, the book of, Ho of Leviticus, sorry, the book of Leviticus reminds us that that's not the case, that's not about this. Holiness should not be understood that way. Holiness should be understood as the desire to follow God's way with coherence. We are told that everything we do and every part of our lives matter. There should be no distinction between what we call religious and secular concerns. Every building block of our existence matters. What we eat, how we do business, how we care for our planet, our relationship with our family, our neighbors, our stranger, all of it is important. Holiness is accepting that God's presence, God's way permeate all, all aspects of the extraordinary and the very ordinary moments of our lives. Holiness, for this reason, cannot be just a mere feeling or a positive disposition toward another person. It has to be way much more than a simple piety or keeping religious observance. Holiness must be based on the way God regards us and deal with us. You see, we make mistakes on a regular basis. We, and we confess them honestly to God. And God does not hold a grudge against us. God forgives us unconditionally. Also, we are all, all different from one another. We profess uh, different creeds, various statements of faith, of philosophy. And God does not have favorites. God loves us all. Some of us are rich, others are poor. Some have higher education, though others can barely read and write. It does not matter for God. God welcome and value all. God does not categorize or rank us. So for us to be holy as the Lord God is holy, is to base our whole existence on the same principle. When people do something we do not necessarily agree with, well, we can stay away from slander and gossips. When we meet a stranger and a refugee or an individual whose name is not from here, well, we're invited to treat them fairly and equally. When our society disregard or forget the poor and the destitute. We are called to be involved actively in our society for the well-being of our neighbors. And we need to remember that holiness cannot be achieved by remaining all by ourselves in, in our beautiful sanctuaries. It cannot be reached by trying to put a check between every sentences of a lengthy book has to be more than outward keeping of regulation. Holiness has to be a way of life, a philosophy, a disposition, an attitude of the heart, 
a series of guiding principles or, or a series of core values in which our actions or decisions, all of them are grounded. I often repeat that we cannot claim some beliefs on Sunday morning and go in complete direct, uh, complete opposite direction for the rest of the week. We cannot say that God calls us to love one another and then go into the world and start discriminating some of our brothers or some of our sisters. We cannot profess our love for God's creation and at the same time invest our money in, in, in industries and corporation that destroys them. To be holy as the Lord God is holy require us to sing the same tune every day, wherever we go. It is acknowledging the interconnection between all parts of God's creation to learn how to weave together worship, justice, charity, love, holiness, consists as understanding our lives as a whole, unified. That is to be used to answer God's call to create a better world for all. And for this reasons, the book of Leviticus should be understood as more than a collection of ancient and historic rules and custom from which we can pick and choose what would and ends your, our agenda. It is an invitation to live our lives with integrity in everything we do and every decision we make and every moment of our existence. We're called to be grounded in God's way, in God's vision for a world, and in God's love for humankind. To put it simply, all of us is called by God to be holy all the time, nothing less. Amen.